Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host Simon, and uh, what goes on here if you're new is that Callum, our fine scriptwriter, has put me together a script. Jen is afterwards going to produce it, add some music, add some images, all of that fun stuff. And of course, I'm just the middleman. I just read it and explore a new topic that I know nothing about. Along with you guys, this is Cropsy, the bogeyman. Of, is it bogeyman or boogeyman? Bogeyman. I feel like there might be a difference between the British and the American here, but I'm not sure. Let's uh, ask the wizard. Pronunciation wizard, tell me. He doesn't have bogeyman. <laughs> Come on, he has bogey. Oh, I would definitely say bogey. Like your bogeys in your nose. Boogeyman, whatever. Let's go with him because he is a smart big brain and I'm not. Every town has its urban legends. In some places, locals will swear that there are cryptid creatures roaming the woods. In others, it's murderers, hitchhikers, haunted schools, sewer alligators, satanic cults. The list goes on and on. I must have grown up in a really boring town because I don't remember any interesting like urban legends. Maybe there are urban legends at school, but I don't even think so. Nah, it's, it's, it's too boring for me. What unites the vast majority of these stories is that they're most often a load of superstitious nonsense. Or maybe I was just like, that's not real. I've always just been so skeptical. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a murderer. No, there's not. There's not. I've never heard of it. There's the poli- no. But in some rare, rare instances, these campfire stories have a sinister vein of truth in them. Such was the case around 30 years ago in New York, where the myth of a hook-handed child killer was brought to life through the vicious crime spree of an all-too-real murderer. I feel like if you... This feels like made-up villain all over, right? His name is Cropsy, which sounds like... Just like terrifying, but also like the sort of name that you'd give a villain from a horror movie that wasn't very good and had a really small budget. Be like, Cropsy's coming through the crops. And then he's got a hook hand and he's a child killer. It's just like, let's get all of those stereotypes in real quick, shall we? As you'll see today, the borough of Staten Island was home to some truly horrific stories through the 20th century, both fact and fiction. Today we'll be looking at one of the most infamous of all, a nightmare at the intersection of local legend and true crime. This is the story of Cropsy, the crop kit knight, the boogeyman of Staten Island. The story. The legend of Cropsy is much like any other campfire horror story told in every other part of the USA. The legends went that a hook-handed mental patient escaped from captivity and took up residence in the tunnel system under the dilapidated ruins of the old Seaview Hospital and abandoned tuberculosis sanatorium in Willowbrook, Staten Island. And if I was setting my hokey horror movie in a location, it would be an old asylum, preferably a tuberculosis asylum, on an island. Aside from giving shot, this has to be a horror movie, right? There's already a horror movie. There's probably five horror movies made about this very story. Aside from giving children an unwanted phobia of amputees, this bedtime story was useful for preventing kids from exploring dangerous abandoned buildings, of which the island has many, or staying out too late. I'd be like, yo, abandoned buildings, let me tell you the story of asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> that should be enough to keep you out of those abandoned buildings, all right? Because it's going to ruin you later. Many years later, you'll die. Because come nightfall, old Cropsy emerged to prowl the streets, dragging away children to his subterranean lair. The tale was shared at camping trips and sleepovers in the decades following the hospital's closure in 1961. Like all urban legends, it has many iterations and storytellers changing as it was passed down the generations. The killer even made it onto the big screen in 1981 in the slasher film The Burning. What did I tell you? Cropsy is a horror movie in a box. Sometimes Cropsy wields an axe, sometimes garden shears, and sometimes he hangs his hat in some other rundown part of town. But the core of the story is always the same. Deranged vagrant hunts for children and drags them back to his decaying lair to murder them. So far, nothing too troubling, right? I don't know, Callum. <laughs> Maybe the fact that there's a scary serial killer who murders children does trouble me a little bit, but uh, each his own. I mean, we've covered some of the most awful stories out there in previous episodes. I'd ex hardly expect you to flinch at some B-movie slasher nonsense. Well, yeah, except you'd, fl you'd, you'd flinch if it was all true. <laughs> you like see some bad horror movie, you're like, ah, you know, whew, it's not real. And then afterwards, they're like, this was a documentary. Be like, what the f***? <laughs> 
However, what comes next gets pretty dark indeed. For the parents of Staten Island, fact and fiction were about to converge in the most terrifying way imaginable. I don't think he's real. Cropsy's not a real, like, it's, there's no one from this sanatorium, right? But there's probably some, uh, again, like I should say it, I've not read this before. I have no idea what's going to happen or what's going on. Although I have definitely vaguely heard of Cropsy. Like, but I don't know the story. My gut feeling right now is that there's going to be some deranged psycho dude who's like, yeah, I'm going to become Cropsy. And everyone's going to be like, what are you up to, mate? The reality. After a string of real-life disappearances in the 70s and 80s, this boogeyman invented to terrify kids started haunting the minds of parents, too. Children went missing from their neighborhoods in broad daylight and were never seen again. First came the disappearance of five-year-old Alice Pereira. She was snatched while playing in the lobby of her apartment building on Tissons Lane in 1972. Then in 1981, seven-year-old Holly Hughes was sent out to a deli two blocks from her home to fetch her mother a bar of soap. The shopkeeper was the last person to ever see her. Wait. To me, a deli is a delicatessen. Delicatessen, it sells like sandwiches and meats. <laughs> and soap. <laughs> Three years later, a similar fate befell 10 year old Ty Tyre Heath Jackson. She and her family were staying at the Mariners Harbor Motel after their own apartment caught fire. Tyre Heath was asked by a fellow resident to pick up some things from the supermarket and was never seen again. The oldest victim was 21-year-old Henry Gaforio, a developmentally challenged young man with the mental age of a young teenager. He was last seen drinking at a bar called the Spa Lounge. He left the bar at 4 a.m. and was reported missing by his family later that day. All of that is enough to give any parents a lump in their throats. With an ever-expanding string of disappearances and no conclusive culprit, the residents of Staten Island were in a panic. Nobody needed to make up stories to scare kids any longer. The legend of Cropsy was becoming far too real. The next disappearances bore a striking resemblance to the macabre myth. When 12-year-old Jennifer Schweiger, who had Down syndrome, went missing in summer of 1987, a massive search effort was launched. Hundreds of volunteers combed parks and the waste grounds of the borough, and after 35 days, one of them made a horrific discovery. Bob Devine was one of the volunteers tasked with searching the recently abandoned Willowbrook State School just a few miles from Seaview Hospital. Hidden away in an area of woodlands on the expansive grounds was a patch of loose earth. Devine told the New York Times, when we dug it up, we found a little foot there. It's something that's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Oh, that is dark. Jennifer had been murdered and buried in a shallow grave. A clue to who had committed such a horrific crime was buried in the history of the abandoned school itself. This was only the most recent horrific episode to unfold on the grounds of Willowbrook. Opened in 1938, the school was a publicly funded home for mentally disabled children, which was long plagued by accusations of abuse. After World War II, it became increasingly inundated with students, and by the 1960s, it was so chronically overcrowded that filth and disease were rife. It now no longer had any semblance of an educational institute. With the depleted staff heavily outnumbered by the students, oversight became extremely lax, leading to neglect and outright abuse. Things were so bad that even President Kennedy was directly aware of the problem, labeling Willowbrook a snake pit in the mid-1960s. It wasn't until 1972 that the public understood exactly what he meant. That year, a doctor, appalled by the conditions of the school, invited journalist Geraldo Riviera to expose the place to the world. His footage showed the extent of the deprivation therein and exposed the rampant physical and sexual abuse of certain members of staff. If I was that school, I'd be like, yo, no, the journalist can't come looking around my school because we're doing terrible things here and I don't want that all over the papers, thank you. <laughs> but no, I'm glad he did. <laughs> Worst of all the horror stories from Willowbrook were the reports of unethical medical experimentation. Whoa. I mean, like, abuse, definitely bad. Sexual abuse, worse. Medical experimentation, my dudes? What are you up to? Medical staff at the school had intentionally injected young people with hepatitis in an effort to study the disease. What are you doing? This, I know this got, there's definitely a history of this. I mean, I've made a video, a couple of videos about the Tuskegee experiments, which are insane and recent history. This is recent history. Relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it was the 1960s, 70s? 70s. This went on for a full 14 years before anyone stepped in to put a stop to it. Once the story broke, the doctors defended themselves by saying that the same strains of hepatitis were rife in the hospital anyway, around 90%, so those mentally challenged kids would probably get it anyway. No biggie, right? Um... Yeah, Biggie, you are a doctor. How about trying to deal with the hepatitis rather than intentionally giving it to more people than already have it? That is not an excuse. 
I hope you go to prison. Why bother kept trying to care for the kids when your institution is failing miserably already? Amazingly, those bastards aren't the worst villains of today's story. That title goes to our real-life Cropsy, who also happened to be employed by the school during that period. Now nah, I'm not surprised. He's employed by the school where people are abusive and they inject children with uh, terrible diseases. Uh, shocking. Despite the outcry that followed Riviera's expose, it took a further 15 years before Libret closed its doors for good, just months before the little girl Jennifer was found buried there. Cropsy Unmasked the discovery of Jennifer's body led to an extensive search of Willowbrook. It was well known that a loose community of vagrants had made camp around the sprawling 385-acre grounds? Holy shit, that is a giant school, including the tunnels underneath. Some were ex-residents with nowhere else to go, others were drifters from out of town, but one man in particular stood out to investigators. Like an extremely morbid episode of Scooby-Doo, the boogeyman of Staten Island was finally unmasked, and it was the janitor all along. This was Andre Rand, the former custodian of Willowbrook, some reports say, did a brief stint as an orderly. Honestly, given the conditions of that hospital, I'd be like, yeah, janitor orderly, yeah, same, same, yeah. Born in 1944 under the name of Frank Russian, Rand was a Manhattan native who himself is thought to have suffered from mild developmental problems. Early in his teenage years, his father passed away and his mother was committed to an asylum. Whatever trauma that might have caused him, he went on to inflict it on others tenfold. Rand had a long list of offenses against children to his name. So why on earth, why on earth does he have a job in a school? For developmentally challenged kids. What are you up to, government? Who, police, whoever's responsible for this nonsense. Ever since losing his job in the 60s, he made a home for himself in the area surrounding his old workplace. It would appear that this was his base throughout a decades-long crime spree across the island and the surrounding boroughs. In 1969, about three years after losing his job at Willowbrook, he spent 16 months in prison for attempting sexual assault on a nine-year-old girl. My do what is going- 16 months? for attempted assault on a nine-year-old. That's like less than a year and a half. What is going on? Then in 1983, he hopped into a bus full of kids from the local YMCA and drove off with them to an airport across state lines. I feel like that's got to get you locked up forever, right? There's gonna you're, you're kidnapping 20 kids or whatever and driving. I don't know what driving across state lines, but I know from movies that it's a bad thing. Maybe it makes it a federal crime? I'm just absolutely guessing from watching loads of movies that that makes it a federal crime. Cropsy's magical mystery tour landed him another sentence for unlawful imprisonment. Pretty lucky considering it was basically a mass kidnapping. How do you see this dude who previously tried to sexually assault a nine-year-old girl and spent 16 months in prison and then he drives off on a bus and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was it? What did they say? Unlawful imprisonment. Lock him up forever, judge. What is wrong with you? Whoever his lawyer is, legends. I mean, terrible, terrible legends. He only spent 10 months behind bars this time. On both occasions, Rand thankfully never got through with his sick intentions in full, but it's likely he got away with far more crimes. Remember the disappearance of five-year-old Alice Pereira? Rand was a prime suspect in that case, mainly on account of his past record. He was also seen in the company of Holly Hughes when she walked to the deli in 1981, the last day anyone saw her. Died. Guilty! <laughs> Tyhees Jackson disappeared just 12 days after the real-life Cropsy was released from prison following the bus escapade. Guilty, making him a strong suspect there too. And then there's the case of Henry Gaforio. Some witnesses reported seeing him with Andre Rand in a diner the morning after he left the bar. If he was complicit in the abuse at Willowbrook during his time there, he would have no problem praying on the disabled like that. Rand's crimes weren't just restricted to young people either. It's thought he may have had a hand in the disappearance of Ethel Louise Atwell in 1978. She was a physical therapy aide at Willowbrook. She arrived at the school before sunrise on October the 24th, and several co-workers heard her screaming in the car park. When the police arrived to investigate, the only trace of Ethel was some clothes and belongings dropped by the side of her car. If he really is to blame for all of these crimes, then it seems like Rand was a violent opportunist, fond of preying on vulnerability. In July of the year prior, 18-year-old Audrey Lynn Nerenberg went missing while going out for a pack of cigarettes in Brooklyn. The night before, she and her family went to a cinema, which was in close proximity to one of Rand's campsites. Some have speculated that he might have singled her out that evening. It's an extremely frustrating trend we're seeing. Andre Rand was adjacent to so many disappearances and deaths, but there was never enough evidence to take it beyond the initial interrogations. The same was actually true at first in the latest disappearance. I feel like there's a point where it's like, there's enough circumstantial evidence, no? Like, there's some witnesses. Can't we, can't we get the guy somehow? Please, police, come on. Rand was identified as a suspect early on after witnesses claimed to see him walking alongside Jennifer Schweiger the day he disappeared. He was even caught lying to the press and changing his story, but there wasn't enough evidence to definitively link him to Audrey. 
Now, however, the connection seemed pretty conclusive. His ramshack or Willowbrook campsite was just a short walk from where the body was found. Trial once the public had a face to pin on their fears, Rand became probably the most detested villain that Staten Island has ever known. Images of him being dragged down the courthouse steps by police, wild-eyed with saliva hanging from his mouth, made the front page of all the papers. That's another horror movie trope right there, isn't there? Although in the movies, they don't really capture the bad guy and send him off to prison. <laughs> Just like, that's not horror movies. It was then that people really started to draw a tepid. He looks like a horror movie dude. The wild eyes, saliva, it's like a rabid dog. It was then that people really started to draw attention to the eerie similarities between his story and the urban legends of old. Just like his fictional counterpart, Andre Rand inhabited an abandoned place. Not quite the Seaview Hospital, but Willowbrook is actually in the same neighborhood as the old tuberculosis unit. He was also an accomplished and perverted predator who targeted those most vulnerable. I don't think we should use the word accomplished predator, like Harvey Weinstein, accomplished predator. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like, I know accomplished doesn't necessarily mean positive things, but it kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? Could it be possible that some of the stories of Cropsey were directly inspired by Rand's other attempts at snatching children? At any rate, the terrifying way that he brought the nightmare to life left a deep scar in the psyche of the community. In a true eye-for-eye -eye fashion, many were calling for his head on a plate. In 1988, Rand stood trial for the kidnapping and murder of Jennifer Schweiger. It did not go how most of the onlookers would have hoped. Winner's testimony was enough to push through the kidnapping charge, however there wasn't quite enough physical evidence to prove that he was responsible for the murder. Whatever the maximum sentence is for kidnapping, let's just try and get that. Let's just get him locked up for a long time. There remains the reasonable doubt that he could have taken or led the girl to the grounds of Willowbrook where somebody else ended her life. Oh, come on. Really? I can practically feel your frustration reading this, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's unfortunately the way these things go sometimes. Still, the kidnapping charge was enough for a 25-year sentence with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Good. I mean, that feels like a super heavy-handed sentence, which is exactly what this guy deserves because we know he killed people, right? No need to do the maths, I've got your bag. The sentence meant that Andre Rand was set for parole in 2008 and would have been released for sure in 2013. Does that mean that Cropsey now haunts the dark corners of Staten Island once again, albeit a little more elderly and decrepit than before? Given this, this guy was a child predator who went to prison for a really long time. I mean, there's got to be a point like in prison where if you're a child predator, your chances of getting stabbed just eventually reach one, right? Or, or maybe he, they finally found some evidence that keeps him in jail forever. I don't know. Thankfully, no. There's one last twist in the tale, which is as close to a happy ending as I can manage today. In 2004, new evidence emerged in the disappearance of Holly Hughes, the seven-year-old who went missing in 81. Rand actually implicated himself in the crime after blabbing to a fellow inmate. The Good Samaritan kept comprehensive notes of the conversations in which Rand reportedly revealed every detail of the abduction. Wow. I mean, we... It seems like every episode lately we talk about don't write down your crimes. Also, don't tell your crimes to someone else who's writing them down, okay? An expansion of the don't write down your crimes rule. You're welcome. Apparently, he saw himself as a Ted Bundy kind of character and said he would never reveal where the girl was buried. I did say it wasn't a proper happy ending. And the witness testimony of a woman named Dory Tucker, the one who spotted Rand with a missing girl all those years ago, was enough to form the basis for a fresh trial. Rand was once again convicted of first-degree kidnapping and slapped with another 25 years. Years. That 2013 deadline has been pushed back to at least 2037, when he'll finally be eligible for parole. He's going to be dead by then, right? He's, he's old by now. Good. <laughs> it's like things that happen to me in real life, wishing death on people. Rare. Things that happen to me on The Casual Criminalist, wishing death on people most episodes. <laughs> I'm definitely going to hell. After two decades of wondering what happened to the little girl, Holly's family finally had something like justice. Unfortunately, we can't say the same for most of the other victims. Wrap up. Boogeyman or scapegoat? What started off as a creepy myth come true has now given rise to a plethora of spin-off stories, many of them now urban legends in their own right. Nothing like a little conspiracy roundup to take the edge off. Oh my god, we need it today, so here we go. There's a theory that Rand was deeply involved with the sadistic treatment of disabled children at Willowbrook, and his crime spree was a continuation of a sick mission that had started in those days. Perhaps in collaboration with other staff members, he set out to alleviate the suffering as victims. Then there's the crossover with the satanic panic that gripped the USA in the 1980s. The theory goes that a cabal of devil worshippers set up shop in the borough back then, and our man Cropsey was delivering sacrificial victims to them. Seems unlikely, I mean, it just seems Occam's razor, you know? 
He's a straight up sicko. And then there's the theory that Rand was actually a deeply embedded communist operative sent by the Soviets to erode the fabric of US society. Now we are getting really stretchy. Actually, I just made that last one up off the top of my head, but I had you for a second. No, you didn't, Callum. Because, although I would, I wouldn't believe it myself, but I would believe that people believed it. So I guess you did have me. The conspiracy log is a piece of piss. I reckon I could be the next Alex Strokes. <laughs> yes, you could. Alex Jones. Ah! Perhaps a bit more compelling than any of the above is the story of the Willowbrook's own Freddy Krueger himself. Not that I'm going to leap to the defense of a convicted sex offender, but it is true that Rand was only tangentially linked to several of the cases that we mentioned today. He himself claims to be innocent. He says that his connections to Willowbrook and villain status in the media meant that the community were tripping over themselves to blame him for all of the suffering. In a bizarre bit of mail sent to a newspaper from prison, he wrote a Mother's Day love letter to all the ladies on Staten Island who who supported prosecutorial vindictiveness against an innocent person. <laughs> you got too much time in hand in prison, mate. They should put you on some, get, get some labor, make some license plates. Come on. While I seriously doubt that he's innocent of the crimes he was convicted for, I would contest that it's very possible that one or more of the different, different culprits might be to blame for some of the other cases linked to him. Or even if Rand was to blame for all of them, who's to say that he was working alone? Could that mean that there are more cropsies out there lurking in the dark corners of town? Sadly, I think that kind of goes without saying. Yeah, unfortunately. I don't know, we've been doing casual criminals for a while. <laughs> like, there's a lot of weirdos out there, aren't there? Because the real story here is that while the monsters dreamed up in fiction are good for a scare, true terror lies in the fact that there are people like Andre Rand in every country and every city, and they very rarely have hooked hands to make them out. Last thing before we wrap up today, it is important to note that the majority of cases mentioned above have not been conclusively linked to Rand and are still considered cold. That means there are still active efforts to find the victims and discover their stories. In fact, an organization called Friends of Jennifer for Missing Children conducts twice the yearly searches of Willowbrook School, looking for any traces of the missing kids. There's a lot of ground to cover after all. You'll also find profiles of the victims and further details on the Charlie Project website, a database of cold missing person cases in the US. There you can find contact details for these and any other cases that they have on record in the event that you believe that you can help. And finally, some dismembered dependencies. Number one, the story of Andre Rand was explored in the 2009 documentary Cropsy by Joshua Zeman and Barbara Brancaccio. It dives deep into the legend of the Staten Island Boogeyman and to what extent Rand might have directly inspired some of the versions of the story circulating around back in the 1970s and 80s. Well worth a watch if you don't fancy sleeping tonight! Number 2. Ever since his incarceration began, Rand has made a habit of writing to the press with extremely precise penmanship to vent about anything and everything. Just ignore the letters, everybody. I even found one of the letters previously listed for sale online for $50. <laughs> People are weird that they collect this shit. The description says that it contains a rambling plea of innocence, an anecdote about meeting Steve McQueen, claims that he hijacked the bus full of kids for humanitarian reasons, and claims that Volkswagen changed their steering wheels at his suggestion. Best 50 bucks I ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you to Callum for putting it together. Thank you to Jen for editing it. And as always, oh, I'll just say, if you enjoyed it, why not leave me a review if you're listening to this as a podcast or if you're watching on YouTube? It's available in both places. Smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you next time.